Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Linda Mayer. Some of you will know me, of course. I've got some of my wonderful staff here tonight as well. Uh, some personal friends, some wonderful crew from Green Cross that I know. Thanks for coming along. We've come together with the council. We've been passionate for a while about offering more to the community as dog owners. Um, I think there's a lot of education that people would benefit from if we could give it. And it's not about you know, necessarily having the most well-behaved dog or, de or a dog that competes in a show at the Cairns show, but it's about people understanding dogs a little bit and just having a bit of knowledge. So we thought probably one of the most, well, it is the most controversial topic, and I know from previously working in animal management, that barking is a huge issue. Uh, not only for dog owners, but for other residents in the community that experience the barking of their neighbours' dogs or people's dogs down the street. So we thought let's initially start with a topic that we could probably all benefit from. So even if your dog's not known to be an excessive barker, you can certainly you know, take on board some of the tips that I'll give tonight. It's going to be a very brief overview, as we know, because it's a, it's a topic that can expand into many different behavioural problems. So it's not just black and white sometimes. It's certainly not an easy fix. So I would say to anyone that, you know, even if you ring me privately to talk about this, it's not going to be something that would be fixed in five minutes. And it does require commitment, but I think any part of dog ownership does do that. So I just wanted to introduce to my very special friend, Ellie, who's laying there having a sleep. She's my Australian Shepherd that comes along and does a lot of work with me. I have two other beautiful dogs, but she tends to be the one that enjoys coming to do some stuff like this. So I will touch on crating as part of... Um, some stuff we're going to talk about tonight and also the benefits just I like to people to see it in its physical sense because many people are concerned about doing things like this with dogs just as part of a training program and um, I think she's proof in the pudding that there's not too much stress going on there at the moment with that dog um, she's quite happy to be there so we're just going to as I said I've broken tonight down into just some very basic topics initially and we'll go through those each each one individually and then at the end, everyone's welcome to ask some questions. And if you have any questions and you can't get to it tonight, by all means, I've left my cards there as well. Just give me a call. I'm happy to talk to people as much as you'd like to talk to me about your dogs. If I can help in some way like that, even if you're not coming to my classes, you're very welcome. So why do dogs bark? Common causes, as we know. We've got boredom, lack of physical and mental stimulation, which is a big one. Territorial behaviour, separation anxiety, attention-seeking behaviour, fear and during play, all right? So just going on to that first one, boredom. Many people ring me with these problems and I did laugh when we got those photos together because thankfully I've not come home to that just yet. <laughs> but I know people who have, okay? So remembering with destruction like that, it can also be a combination of behaviours that have caused that as well. But many dogs that are doing that sort of thing are also barking. So when I talk to people with my business and with my classes and the behaviour consults I do, we discuss a lot of things about what can we do to keep our dogs busy. So we all know that we can give them a bone and we can do things like that. We can give them a toy. I think what happens there is we commonly give them toys and bones all the time so the dog becomes used to the same thing every day. A bit like kids, they get bored with the same activities. So I would firstly recommend varying things, not a bone every day too. A lot of dogs I see are too well fed, so bones actually aren't that interesting. They'd rather go and bury them in the garden and dig a big hole in your garden while they're doing it. Um, I would certainly recommend toys, but I would look at the sort of toys that you have. I've actually had people say their neighbours complain about the squeaky noise that the toy's making whilst the dog's playing with it. So you can have controversy even over a toy you might give your dog to keep them entertained. I like to do other little activities, which some of my staff do regularly now, and they tell me have great results with. Um, I like to scatter feed dogs. So that's a great way to keep them busy. That can literally mean just putting some dry food out just before you leave. Obviously, dog away from the situation first, plant a little bit, but I initially would say to anyone doing that, start it as a small process, fairly close to, say, the back, back of the veranda or somewhere close where the dog would initially find reward, and then over time extend the area that you plant it. So people have great success with that, for a start. Some more natural things I like to give dogs. Um, my dogs actually don't have many toys, to be honest. They're not interested in them, but they spend a lot of time chewing bits of wood that are laying around, bits and pieces like that that I'll get. Some of the crew find coconut husks are great. Again, medically, I always say to people to talk to your vet about that with some dogs who could actually ingest some of that and eat it, though. So I'm always very careful. A lot of dogs like to shred coconuts, but some dogs actually then like to eat some of that sort of stuff as well. So you'd be careful about that sort of thing. Um, just other activities around, some people can plant things here and there, not only food based, but reward and toy based behavioural things too. And most of the dogs that I deal with, which goes into a lot of other topics, are also under, under exercised 
physically and also mentally understimulated. So therefore, over time, they're not actually getting enough work for their brain or their body. And that can then progress into some of this destructive stuff. So even though you can provide a great amount of toys and bones for those sort of dogs, there's too much else going on as well. They're not even interested in some of that sort of stuff. All right, so that would be the first. There's many other little things. I always say to people, there's so much access to ideas literally online nowadays that people make up their own little activity things for dogs that I think are fantastic. I'm not saying don't go and buy things from pet shops and stuff, but have a look at, some, I always look at some of the texture. So this dog here loves wood, just sticks, not hard sticks. I'll often get soft sticks. Certain trees around are like that. Sometimes they'll pick up a little bit of driftwood from the beach even. Doesn't eat it, so I'm careful of that. She doesn't eat it, but she loves chewing them. And she's actually encouraged my little Shih Tzu Poodle to do the same thing. He carries them around as best he can. Um, and more so than, as I said, I've got a couple of rubber dog toys laying in the yard and those dogs probably pick them up once every six months, if that. And it would only be if I actually physically throw them. So a lot of those things I think are probably things that just sit in the yard and aren't even worth worrying about for the dog. Would certainly be encouraged to use it if you're playing with them. All right, so if we go on to why do dogs bark lack of stimulation? All right, so we've got some photos there today that I just wanted to, I suppose, explain a little bit to you as well. So there's a difference in taking a dog to a dog park and letting it run around like, like a mosh pit, as I say in my classes, which is what a lot of dog exercise areas are. So we're physically creating dogs that are canine athletes, but we're not doing anything with their brain. And over time, we're winding them up to be fitter and fitter. So if they were Kelpies on a sheep farm, that would be ideal. But when they're dogs that are required to sit in a backyard for quite a long time, I think that also is something people need to address. Because we concentrate a lot on throwing the ball or taking them to the beach and letting them run for three quarters of an hour down the beach whilst they're usually harassing other people and other dogs as well. But we're not doing anything mentally to work the dog. So stimulation can come from walking, obviously, but I like to promote controlled walking, more so than dogs running around everywhere sniffing the ground and dragging their owners up the street. And I also like to promote a lot of actual brain work, like you're seeing there. So people underestimate the value of those dogs laying in a line on a drop position there with the owners at front, they've given a stay command. As those dogs are laying there, those brains are working. All right, there's impulse control going on, there's all sorts of communication between the dogs there. And many people underestimate that I think we all concentrate on the physical side of things. So I would certainly recommend to anyone, not necessarily that you have to do formal obedience classes by any means, but look at some ways to actually train your dog to use its brain a bit through some obedience command work, okay? And certainly controlled walking is, is a big thing. So again, if the dog's out on the street pulling you up the street on the end of a lead, then it's generally undoubtedly probably got other behavioural um, problems at any point that are compounding with that as well, which can then lead to barking. Remember, overexcited, overstimulated dogs walking on leads, either out in the middle of the street or up the footpath along other people's fence lines are creating barking problems as well. All right, so I know no one here probably does fall in that category, but when you're allowing your dog to walk up the fence line of someone else's dog on a fence on the opposite side, you are creating a problem for your own dog, plus that dog inside the fence. So I know with proof with my own that when new dogs move into my street, if my dogs walk calmly up the street for a week or so, those new dogs don't bark at my dogs. Yet you will see them regularly barking at other dogs that are out of control. So I think that's a relevant issue. If we all addressed how our dogs walk and how we walk them up the street, would we then create a calmer neighbourhood anyway? Okay, obviously a bit nicer to walk your dog when it's walking nicely like that as well, which is doable for anybody. Okay, I never say to anyone it's not possible to achieve that, but it takes work. So I, I used to be someone that said, look, it's just a little walk every day and that, but what I know is it's commitment. It's a daily commitment. It's not a lifestyle of eight hours a day, but it's commitment every day to achieve that with your dog. And the work you put in will be seen on the end of the lead as time goes on and certainly in the behaviour of the animal as well. All right, so again, we'll, we'll touch on a lot of these when you ask me questions too, but it's nice for you to see um, different concepts of what I think training's about and where's training's going since 25 years ago when I started all of this stuff. So if my little, yeah, there we go, territorial barking. This is probably one of the most common barking related issues, I would reckon, if we were to, it's hard to know because you can't always get, you know, a lot of times when complaints come in, it's just necessarily that the dog's barking. But I know from my own personal involvement with dogs over the years, you would have the instance of the dog on the left just barking probably at, at traffic moving past, 
and that can obviously, our most common issue that we see with that would be the postman. Everyone sees the dog or hears the dogs that are getting wound up as the postman's coming up the street. But then your territory barking where you've got dogs neighbouring each other on properties, barking through fence lines. And even when it's not a visible situation like that, we're getting a lot of territory barking, even if they can't see each other. Okay? As I said, dogs barking on fence lines. So I'm a huge believer in you need to look at your own environment in the yard. For me, we recently changed the dynamics of our property um, through choice because we replaced our front fence. We put our dogs to the back and we're in a close, so it's very quiet there really. And after three months of doing that and having them temporarily fenced to the back, me and my husband looked at each other and said, we're actually going to remain, it's going to stay like this. Even though we had a small amount of traffic, as we say, walking, riding bikes, walking dogs past, we had virtually zero barking compared to the occasional barking that we had when people were moving past. So even me, to be home, to, I can't be home 24-7 to control that, and that's the biggest issue too. You can do all the training in the world, but then at the end of the day, while well, you've done three hours of training every day for a week and then you're away for a, a, an eight-hour shift at work, your dog could likely be running up and down the fence barking again. So for my dogs, it's a better, it's a better option. They're calm. They're a lot quieter, they're less stressed because they don't feel the need to be barking up and down territorially to do that sort of thing. Remember, dogs going up and down, up and down fence lines will literally be achieving something in their own mind. So it's a chase type behaviour and if you have a working breed that escalates as we know and actually then starts to bring out genetic behaviour in them as well. So I would say as hard as that can be for some people, I understand the logistics of that. If you have the option to fence your dog away from a main traffic area, same as I get a lot of people asking me about laneways up the side of properties. All right, that's a big one. Territory of other dogs around you. So no, you can't fence your dog completely into a small box in the middle of the yard so it doesn't access all the fences. But again, there's certain times most of you would notice that dogs are active to do a lot of that behaviour. I see my own, we have with neighbours out the back in a pool, they'll actually go down barking often at the kids playing in the pool, which doesn't happen every day, but it's generally a weekend activity that the family does there, which is fine because that's their property, so I'm respectful of that. This brings into play where I use things like this. So if they're having their Saturday afternoon barbecue with their family, my dogs run down to bark and they have dogs at the back too and they never bother each other any other time, then I as the responsible neighbour will say to my dogs, you need to come up and sit in your crates for a while now basically. Those people have a right to be in their backyard doing what they're doing and I'm not stepping out the door every five minutes to yell out at you to come back here. So although I could correct that when I'm home, again, there's times where I can't. So if I can modify that, and I know generally it's not happening through the day. Little things like that, I think we as owners as well need to be a little bit considerate of other people. So a lot of people would say, look, my dog's just in the yard and it's just barking. But is that also showing respect to other people who perhaps don't have a dog or who have a dog that doesn't bark a lot in general if we all work together? I think that's a huge thing to think about. Um, if you have issues with two dogs fighting through a fence line, then there's a lot of behavioural stuff that needs to be done. The hard part about that is that sometimes the people who own the other dog may not be as receptive to help out with that stuff. So it's a, it's a very technical issue that I'll often go through with people, but it's not a five minute fix for that either. So again, we would address many reasons as to why that's happening. Again, what I do know is a mentally and physically tired dog is less likely to behave with a lot of these issues. Okay. If you get along with your neighbours as well, and, and we hope that everyone does, then I would also suggest talking to them a little bit, you know, and we can, we can go through that a little bit more too um, as we get further through the slides. Just talking to people about how they go about interacting with your dog. A lot of people think they're doing the right thing often. I've even had people say their neighbours throw food over the fence to the dog and stuff. Often that's actually encouraging the behaviour. So if we're walking, we know keep the dog away from fence lines. Don't let your dog go up and down people's nature strip using that as a toilet. That's aggravating the dogs inside as well, which is a common problem why dogs get very ag agitated. At that. You know, early hours of the morning, as we know, and late evening is a high traffic time. So if I lived on a busy area and I knew that I had people going past, if I couldn't fence my dogs to the back, I'd be looking at options like this as to how I could actually contain my animals in that high traffic time. So I'm not just not going to allow that behaviour to even happen. Therefore, I don't have to correct anything. Over time, I can remove the interest in a lot of dogs by doing that. All right, and I have done it with dogs, with clients. We can't stop a, bark, a dog barking completely. That's a, a, a crucial thing that we all need to understand. You can't completely stop them barking, but you can certainly help them cope with situations. The longer the behaviour goes on, the harder it is to fix. So if we wait till we've had a complaint or we get notes from neighbours or we have a dog that's extremely agitated and stressed and starts doing things you know, that could hurt itself or anyone else or even it's another dog that's on the property. So we see instances where dogs are running fence lines where they'll redirect to each other if there's one, more than one dog. 
and often owners would go to correct and they'll redirect that, that frustration and anxiety and aggression onto their owner. That's when we know we've probably let it go a long way past where it should have gone and we really need to start to address it quite seriously. Some of you may have seen that where you're walking, you'll see two dogs on a fence line barking flat out at someone walking past, then they'll all of a sudden turn in that anxious moment and actually redirect it often towards each other. And that can escalate to a major problem. So little things like that we're aware of as well. Um, our next little slide of, so separation anxiety, probably one of the biggest problems that dog owners face today. Even if their dog's not barking, I see more anxious dogs now than I've ever seen in my life doing this. And I have, haven't really been doing it that long. And why do I think that's happened? I think the dynamics, as I say, of dog ownership has changed immensely. So I think we, more than any other time in our lives, all of us are, are actually humanising them. We are thinking human when we're interacting with them. We are treating them like human babies, some of us. And we are forgetting that at the end of the day, every dog, no matter what shape or size, has a canine brain. And they don't think like us. And they don't speak our language, because as I said, they could actually all be sitting in the chair right now having a listen to me if they did. And we could explain to them, could you please stop doing this because this is causing problems? Or why are you feeling anxious? Is it something we're doing wrong? But dogs don't understand any of that. What we've done is changed how we live with them. So for me, as a, with a rural background, I just look at, for a start, the amount of dogs that are inside homes now, that are living in homes as if the home belongs to them, as if it's their castle, as I say, where it's actually ours. So I would certainly address that as part of separation anxiety, for a start. So a dog that is constantly with its owner, even if you work eight hours and then you come home and you have the dog constantly with you then, without moments of separation and boundary and a little bit of training where you could say to the dog, I'm, I'm sitting over here and you can sit over here, you are slowly over time building up anxiety. Okay, we all try to substitute, or we've been away for eight hours, we need to give them as much as we can while we're home. That's actually often the wrong way to go about it. It's a great thing, I think you can have dogs inside, but if you set those boundaries, I think they're better for it. I think they're better inside, outside, if you're gonna go that way, not totally inside. My dogs live totally outside, that's just my personal choice. I don't have issues with separation anxiety, but I do use many things like these training tools, as I say, to help. So for many owners, again, with separation, we look at what do we do before we go? There's a common rule out there, and most people would be aware of it now. You should ignore your dog before you leave. Most of us build up anxiety. We're even thinking about how we're feeling. It starts to portray all these emotions to the dog. Remember, dogs can literally smell our emotions. So we know they smell things from us because we see them in assistance roles, we see them doing things that are beyond our comprehension as humans, as I say. There's many things about them that are way beyond how intelligent we really think we are. But people actually go down the wrong road, so they, they portray anxiety. The more they see anxiety in their dog, they try to soothe it out of the dog. They try to treat the dog like a child and they talk to it and try to explain to it that you need to calm down, I'm going to work for eight hours, darling, I'll be home. I'll leave the radio on, love, and a few little things for you to do. And I hear people talk to dogs like that, and it's okay, but the dog's got no idea what you're talking about. Okay, all it knows is for some reason your body's starting to emit all these pheromones that is full of anxiety. You're sounding anxious in the way you're speaking, and now you're going to turn around and walk out the door and leave me here. So if we built up confidence in that behaviour for a while, and we worked on ignoring the dog, I always say 10 minutes, but for me it wouldn't even be a, a time frame. If I'm going to work in the morning, I might walk my dogs like I do, out in the yard, see you later. I'll see you when I get back. There's no goodbyes, there's no looking at them even when we leave, everyone in the car, off we go. Same when we come home. People build all that anxiety up, they arrive home, dogs jumping all over them. They've got a dog yelping and barking and doing so, and then we're going back to barking because it's barking when you're arriving and it's jumping all over you and it's annoying the neighbours while it's doing it. And then we're trying to correct barking and all the other behaviour and jumping and the things that we don't want, but we need to look at that anxiety thing as well and say, look, if we just set a pattern of letting the dog settle each time we come home, over time we would start to see a decrease in that dependency as well. All right? So they're big things that I work on. I, as I say, think anxiety is one of the biggest behavioural problems that I see now. And when people feel unsure about changing the lifestyle with their dog, <coughs> I would constantly use my own dogs, my staff's dogs, as examples to say there is no anxiety or stress at this point in that animal. Okay, We could look at that and say she's in a cage, but 
the behaviour of that dog does not display any issue at all with that. Now I use these as a kennel on my veranda. My dogs don't live in cages or crates as we call them. But I use them as a training tool. This dog's never been here. All she knows is when this crate's just relax and be calm. Nothing to worry about. Won't matter what's going on around you. So lots of stuff I can guide through people through with that. Um, and sometimes in the most severe cases, we would need to contain dogs. Separation anxiety, I've seen dogs leaping over fences. You wouldn't even think possible for them to get out. And then again, we have a lot of barking and separation. I hear it actually a little bit in my neighbourhood with a couple of dogs, so I hear them howling every time the owners leave. What I do know, and that's not, you know, is that those dogs never get walked. I've lived there for eight years and I've never seen those dogs out of the yard. Okay, so we wonder, you know, is the dog happy? I can't really say that because no dog's ever been able to tell me that. But what I do know is when it's anxious, it's not happy because when I'm anxious, I'm not happy. If I've got stress, okay, I'm not feeling great. But remembering a little bit of stress to push through to a good result at the end is okay. And that's where I know a lot of people feel uncertain about behavioural changes or interactive changes with their dog because they feel the dog's going to be stressed so I need to stop. But we all know if we just pushed a little bit further through that we would get a great result at the other end and the animal would be better for it. So I like to, as much as I can, help people get through that stuff because it's the human that needs the help often as we know. The dog would be fine as long as we can help the people to get you know, to the other side of it. And hopefully you don't come home to that um, at any point. So we can only imagine the stress some of those dogs have gone through. I know some of those photos are set up, but to, to, to get to that point. Can you imagine the stress that animal's going through to get to that point? Yet if we could implement some things into our lifestyle that would remove the anxiety like that, to do things like that, then that would be a great result. It's not going to be a total fix. I, do, I have owned dogs over the years that still chew things occasionally. Mine are not perfect. My old border collie's not here, but she's the one that, if she could speak for herself, would say, but she still digs holes occasionally. So, you know, they're not, they're an animal. We can't make them a robot. They like to have a bit of fun doing natural things. So what else have we got that makes dogs bark? So attention seeking. All right, when I go and do behaviour consults, that, in, that middle picture actually makes me smile because they're things I look at when I walk into people's houses. Is there big slobber marks up the back door? All right, or screens half hanging off? which is common, or people have already told me they've replaced the door 25 times before I came and, and things like that. So that can be attention-seeking barking, which generally, as we know, would often happen when you're home, but again, it's an annoying bark to the people next door, and it's a dog that's not only anxious, but it's also started to realise many times after doing it repeatedly that I'll probably get what I want if I keep up with this stuff. So how do we work through that? And then the other picture I thought was just relevant because a lot of people not thinking can be in the backyard with a dog that's attention seeking with a ball throwing activity, for example, and it's barking its head off, okay? Or it's a dog that every time you walk out, it grabs a ball and races to you and drops it at your feet, all right? Now, remember that dog over time is building up a certain amount of anxiety and anticipation over the object. So there's a stress issue related there and an anxiety-based behaviour. And then we have the dogs, of course, that are attention-seeking. So they have an anxiety-based behaviour, which probably would extend into separation anxiety, I would imagine, for most of them, when the owners are not there. Many different types of behaviour that we can work on. Um, I'm a believer if your dog loves to chase a ball, that's great, but the ball should be put away and bought out when you decide, not the dog. So I like to use that also as a great way to reward. So we can use a dog that's motivated by those sorts of activities in training as well to say, look, this is something that's gold for you. So let's do some really good stuff together. And then that's your reward at the end. And as we know in working dogs and in service dogs, that's generally the, it's really the base of what they do in the training. So any of our police dogs, any of those dogs that do those amazing jobs that we see, there's always a tug reward at the end of, of an activity like that or some sort of activity that, that really promotes the dog's behaviour to keep doing those activities for them. They generally use very little food based training in those sorts of things as we know, but they, they genetically will, will choose dogs that have a high drive to chase things and get a reward that way. So that is certainly something, but I mean for myself at home on a personal level, if we throw the ball in the backyard, um, this one loves to chase the ball with the kids and the other little dog do loves to as well, but the Border Collie just would be happy to run around both of them barking madly. So it annoys me, let alone my neighbours. So what do I do? I crate the older border collie in her crate and the kids can play with the other two for a while. She's calm and quiet in the crate because she knows that routine and then from there she can come out later. And that's really the only time you hear her bark. In actual fact is in chase behaviour, she's not interested in the ball, she's trying to work the dogs. As nature would have said to her many years ago when she was a pup, something in my brain says when they run I need to chase them and bark. 
So I can utilise training equipment in my home to make sure that I keep everything as calm for myself and also my dogs and, you know, be compliant for my neighbours. So attention-seeking behaviour, that's, that's actually something that we need to address though. So dogs at the back door and things like that, it's not about bursting the back door open and bellowing at your dogs and then you have your neighbours thinking, well, I'm not sure whether the barking dog's worse or the neighbour screaming every five minutes out the back door at the dog. But there's ways we work on behavioural things like that. As I said, there's, there's a, a myriad of things I would go through with people to fix that stuff. And again, not just a quick five minute step out the back door, because most of us will go through this scenario, open the back door, now sit down darling, please stop doing that, sit down. Okay, you're scratching all the back of my door, now stop doing that. Close the door, sit down, or even look at the dog again, up to where we started from. So at that point, we should all be realising, obviously the dog has no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, and that's the thing. We can go through a whole paragraph of behavioural explanation as to why we would rather they don't do that, but if they understood that, they would never keep repeating it. I've seen dogs go for years and be told the same thing and they still perform the same behaviour. So they obviously are not wanting to be compliant or, more importantly, they have no idea what we're talking about. All right, again, Ellie's not absorbing one single thing that I'm saying at the moment, I don't think. <laughs> she probably thought, she's not saying I've heard it all before. So little things like that to address, and me personally, I address it regularly because it is an issue and I, the dog annoys me barking when we're playing, so I just control it, easy. It doesn't happen any other time for that particular dog, so I can easily make my neighbourhood comfortable that way and keep everything quiet um, where I need to. So our other little things that we have up here, little technological, there we go, fear. All right, so fear-based behaviour, and the dog on the left is obviously looking fairly uncertain about something going on, and the other one, of course, is going to probably be thinking about barking reflective to many things that we experience up here. We did also obviously bring into this category fireworks as well, which is huge. This dog is frightened of fireworks, which I've discovered recently. So fear-based barking, remember, can be not only thunder, fireworks, anything relevant to storm or, or things like that, but even different noises in your environment and your neighbourhood, things that sound similar to a noise that's an issue. So for this dog frightened of fireworks, I could say to you that if I walked through a job site and the boys were firing nail guns, I would nearly guarantee you that that dog would have an issue with that noise as well, a very similar type of noise. Yet other things you can do around this dog and it does not blink an eye. Yet I see my other dogs respond to certain things. So for myself, again, containment under moments of stress where I know there's fireworks around, obviously close to where I live, but also obviously at times when we know there's going to be a lot. Storms is not an issue. Storms are a hard one because as we know, you can go to work and it's sunny and then while you're at work at four o'clock in the afternoon, the clouds roll in and you have a big storm. I would say to anyone, if, you, if you're worried about your dog, you need to think of safe con containment of some sort. Does it have to be a crate? Not, not at all. Some people I know will safely contain their dog in a cooler room of the house, things like that. Obviously, I wouldn't put it in places where there could be hundreds of items of furniture that might get chewed under stress. But it, we remember with these things, it's not about, oh, I have a frightened dog, so I immediately need to put it in a crate. This is a process that starts over time. So if it was going to be a room in your house, you would slowly get the dog used to that over time. You wouldn't just wait till the storm season and think, right, well, we've designated that the bathroom where it's nice and cool is where that dog will go in the storm season and we'll just throw it in there now and off we go. These things need to be done over a period of time, which doesn't take a lot of time once you get the animal comfortable. So at any point, at some stage, I'll bring Ellie out and show you, as soon as I walk that dog to the crate, that's what she knows, it's calm and quiet to go there. So in any place in a house, you could, you could have the same scenario. Um, I have many people with high set Queenslanders that build some great little smaller safe enclosures under their homes, even things like that. Main thing is, as we know, that the dog needs to be cool, shaded, have access to water, and that the fencing and the area that you provide is safe. So don't underestimate what an animal will do under fear. Um, I have seen what she has done and pushed through a fence. I wouldn't even think her head would foot fit through, let alone her body and she has done it. So we need to be aware of that always. When I'm saying to people contain an animal, be, be very, very careful about what you're doing. Perhaps test it a few times when you're around close to sea. You can buy products that desensitise them to certain noises. I think what I find maybe sometimes a problem there is you can have the tape of thunder and do all the training and 
but then you might out of the blue have a thunderstorm that comes through at night that rocks the roof on our house like some of them do and it could set the dog straight back so I would always be work, you know, working towards for me for her anything that I think could be anywhere near fireworks even if it's 300 kilometres away I'd be putting her in a crate safe and she because she's, such, she's conditioned to that behaviour there she stays safely she never tries to break out. Now I see severe anxiety in some dogs with that. I also then recommend them often to see people medically at the veterinary practices because some dogs actually probably need some help to get over some anxieties like that if they're really seriously bothered um, and certainly will escape. But be aware of fear. So what I do say about fear though in the neighbourhood. So some dogs are, uns there's certain noises that our dogs hear every day that we don't even hear sometimes, but that, they, that affect them. Whether it's a positive or a negative, they're actually hearing things that we don't even think about. So it goes back to some of that stuff I say to people too. If you walk your dog regularly, so I believe you should walk the same, literally the same route every day around your neighbourhood, which we do. We throw in an odd different activity here and there and obviously they do a lot of training with us, our dogs, and all my staff do the same thing. So the dog gets used to that same environment. So those noises that we don't hear and we don't even think about, they hear regularly if they're walking every day. They perhaps see the dog that they hear three houses down that's barking. They hear that car that leaves at 6.30 every morning and then they see where it is and they slowly over time get conditioned that that's just around the corner and they don't think like that but it's a territory type thing that they're covering every day. Then over time a lot of the dogs don't bark at some of those things. As I said the dog around the street from us moved in doesn't even bark at my dogs now and my dogs aren't bothered by it. Initially they were when it moved in because it had never been there before. Now we walk quietly past. It looks up and literally puts its head back down and goes to sleep. So that dog stopped barking its front yard and my dogs are not at all worried about that dog either now as they walk past. So if we expose them to the same thing, over time noises would be less of an issue for a lot of dogs. We will get new things move into the neighbourhood, which of course would reignite a lot of barking for some of them. But it's not, I'm a great believer in that routine and consistency because in a natural state that's what they would do. They don't, as I say, get together every Sunday at a dog park in, nature, in the wild and have a barbecue and have a chat about the week they've had together. They uh, would initially cover their same territory, be calm and relaxed in doing that. Everyone has a run when we've got to hunt meat and apart from that, there's not much else going on. So although domestic dogs are very far removed from wild dogs now, there's still a lot of their behaviour that's very similar. And I know if we keep that routine, they're much better off for it. So it's interesting to think with dogs that are often fearful in their yards, Perhaps if people got them out more so that they could actually see what's behind those fences and everything and experience it, would be better. And then the other big mistake we make is people start consoling them when they see them like that. They try to soothe behaviour out of dogs. We try to kiss and cuddle them and tell them it's okay. We can help you through this. It's just a nasty thunderstorm. Please sit down. They start patting them. Again, you're just reinforcing the behaviour. You're portraying your anxiety. You're praising the dog for the behaviour it's displaying. And over time, you're just layering that behaviour. So it's a big thing why, again, if we can start to calmly teach them places, I'm not even, if people say to me their dog goes under the bed in a thunderstorm, I think that's okay as long as the dog's happy under there, leave it there. Don't try and drag it out and ask it to sit beside you on the couch and you can talk to it about the storm that's happening overhead. If it's safe under there and it's not hurting itself or anything else, I've seen dogs over the years that have been fine to do that. But make sure that you're not actually, as I say, trying to actually console behaviour. And that would be any fear-based behaviour. When everyone sees a dog like that, we all go to water. And we immediately want to put our arms around it and tell it it's okay. But really that's one of the biggest mistakes we would make in a fear, fear related behaviour. So what else have we got there, Michelle, during play? So why I actually wanted to put this one up just as a little bit separate one is because I know, because I've taken a lot of notice that when I'm driving around, at some of the exercise areas, for example, not only in our backyard, people get down to our dog exercise areas letting dogs run mad barking, which could not at all be nice for the people that reside around those exercise areas who've been approved or have obviously you know, been happy to have that go in or, or certainly been a little bit understanding of the fact that we need to have areas, I suppose, where dogs can run. But I do know that I've seen it regularly. People have dogs running everywhere going mad, so I thought it was appropriate to just put that up to, for people to think about that. If you're going somewhere with your dog to exercise, I mean, a designated dog exercise area, not just randomly running wild in parks everywhere and places where they shouldn't be off a lead, then we should be addressing that as well as responsible owners. So if you've got a dog that you throw the ball for, you know, for in those places and it's barking excessively, then I would recommend that you do it somewhere else. Because could you only imagine what it must be like to live somewhere near, like, near that and have that same repetition of that thing every afternoon for some people? You know, I think most of those people in those areas must be very understanding of, of what they experience as dog owners. 
So I, I personally, as I say, don't mind dog exercise areas, but I'm, I'm one that's very vigilant with my clients about what I think you should be doing as far as exercising where you should take them. So I think they should be areas that are used sensibly, but not an excuse instead of taking the dog for a walk and doing some proper work and training with it, I'll just take it down to the park or the beach and let it run wild everywhere and then I can sit under the shade of the tree and do nothing and eventually the dog will wear itself out. But eventually the dog gets fitter and fitter, as I say, and it's not doing anything else. And then we have obedience problems relevant, or, you know, compliance of commands or the simple thing, can't call the dog as it runs towards someone else's dog. So just something to be aware of. As I said, if it's in the backyard or it's anywhere else, but just be receptive of people around you that might, you know, be living in houses close to those areas and having to listen to the barking and dogs running madly every day. Um, I can't remember what else we, what else? So there. It's a brief overview, because I could go on for a long, long time about behaviour. Behaviour is my passion, because dog training is easy. Anyone can teach a dog to do a few basic commands. Teaching a dog how to live happily in the mad world that we live in now, I think is a whole different kettle of fish. I think they live, they're expected to live a lot differently to when I even grew up as a child. And I think that's part of also why we're seeing so many issues. Is it because they're in smaller yards and everything? I don't think that's relevant. So when people say to me they've got three acres, they don't need to walk the dog. I don't think that's relevant unless you have a working dog that's chasing sheep for 10 hours a day. Okay, what I do know is having worked in a field in a rural community, when we had working dogs on the farm, they were tied up and they'd run 100 k's a day, some of them probably or more. But if I'd taken those dogs off that chain and put them in my backyard, would they have settled immediately into that environment? No way. So it's not about the distance they cover, it's the mental state of the animal as well while it's expected to live. Do dogs need company? I think they benefit from company of their own kind. I see some dogs that pair up with cats as an example. So I think they appreciate the company of something. But I think dogs can also be slowly, you know, you can condition an animal to be comfortable on its own. If you, if you provide enough for it in its life, but it doesn't mean you have to be there 10 or 12 hours a day to, to do that. I've done it myself. I think they benefit from company, as I say, but I don't think it's a total necessity. And if you've got a barking dog, the first thing you don't do is go out and get another dog to stop the barking, because you're probably gonna end up with two dogs barking. All right, and many dogs, as we know, with anxiety actually aren't even interested in the other dog people have bought. They've still got the issue relevant to the owner. So some big things like I would say to people, did we want to go to questions, Michelle? Is that where we're? That would be a good idea. If anyone's got any, and it doesn't, it can be anything at all. Yes, how can I help you? Um, but with, uh, well, you know, going back 20 odd years ago, uh, we, uh, before we actually uh, got uh, a couple of dogs, uh, or one dog, um, we went to the Adelaide Royal Show. Yes. And, um, I'm not sure, I think it was Powell that um, had set this stand up and you had to fill out a questionnaire uh, about your lifestyle. Yes. And then they'd give you, um, they'd give us three dogs that uh, would suit yes. our lifestyle. And uh, one of them was Schnauzers, one was Corgis and one was a Bulldog, I think. Yes. And uh, we ended up getting um, a Schnauzer, but yes. we spoke to uh, one of the top breeders there and she wanted to get to know us for um, well, about three months yep. before she would even consider allowing us to have one of her dogs. Yep. And um, yeah, so the dog was um, designed, or oh, we got the type of dog that was around our lifestyle. Perfect. Where I've seen a lot of people up here in Cairns, yes. uh, they buy a dog that just because they like the look of it, they I don't know. actually consider what the animal? Yeah, how much exercise yes. or whether what they What sort of dog they've taken on? I think that's a great point to bring up because how have those things changed again for all of us? I mean, when I grew up, someone down the road had a litter of pups if you wanted a dog, or you might drive to, I was from down in Vic New South, so you might drive to Melbourne to see a breeder if you were after a particular <coughs> dog. I think that's a huge thing to bring up because many people, as we know, can just go online now and look at a really nice picture or see someone's dog that walking down the street and not even be thinking of the fact that that person might have put hours and years of work into creating that magnificent dog through training and conditioning and behavioural work they've done. And that's right, so then people get the wrong dog. So I personally have, that's a, I think Ellie's a beautiful dog. Many people have said to me, I'd love one of those. She's a great dog, but there's certain things in her lifestyle that wouldn't shoot, suit everyone. I need to have a dog that I can work. Obviously, it suits me, but if that dog was stuck in a backyard all the time, she would be a problem. 
because she's a high energy dog at many times and likes to work. So I think that's a great point. Many of us need to, and, and this is not to be rude to anyone, but I know over time what I see too is some people have had a particular breed of dog. This might be their third or fourth of that breed. But we're also forgetting some of us too that we're all getting a bit older and I'm not meaning that to be rude at all because I know for me I can't perhaps do what I did 10 years ago as far as handling dogs even myself. So then we go and continue following that line of a breed of dog that we love but are we actually being thoughtful enough to think well it's probably not the, the most ideal dog that I could own now because can I give that dog what it needs to keep it happy and to give it a fulfilling life and as much as we love them and think and we also need to be very aware as you said also of where we get the dog so genetics are huge many dogs have like a working bloodline and that can go into many breeds it's not just an actual working dog so we know our you know our collies and our healers and all those sorts of dogs so you can have a show bloodline you could have a working bloodline and then you could have a pet bloodline so also I would recommend to anyone to make sure as best you can to actually view the parents of the, if you're taking on a pup especially, but the hard part then as we know is if you go and rescue some beautiful dogs that we see rescued, um, you're not always sure what you're getting, but be a little bit aware if you can be of what those breeds are. If you can get an idea of a crossbreed dog, have a little think, is that perhaps the right dog for me? That's a great point to bring up because I think people just go, we do, we look at things and think, oh, what a beautiful animal, or we see our friend's dog or a neighbour's dog or a dog down the street and we think, oh, I would really love one of those. We watch a nice movie. We've seen that, a trend of different breeds pop up after nice movies about dogs. None of those dogs started like that. Probably some of those dogs in those movies aren't very well behaved. We just see that little bit where they are. You know what I mean? And people actually think, oh, I'd love a dog like that because if it could do all those things, it'd be amazing. But they're not born that way. I believe no dogs are born bad dogs. So just like us, they have different temperaments, they have different chemical makeups. Some dogs that I meet and breed is not relevant, really do have, I could see it in some puppies, would have a predisposition to anxiety-based behaviour, just like some of us. Some of us are prone to depression and anxiety. I think, I, I know some animals are like that. I saw it in horses, I've worked with horses as years as well. You could see it a lot in foals, in thoroughbreds that I work with. Certain ones you could see would be more prone to an anxious type behaviour. But I think that it's something we can work with if we identify it, which then of course goes into early training. If you've taken on a dog that has those issues, you can do a lot to fix it though. It's never a, oh it's a three year old dog, we can't fix it. I don't believe that. I've seen really old dogs that we've done some great work with once we've started to change a few things for them and they're better off for it. A lot of the dogs that we see in rescue are just there because people don't put the time in or they don't want to, it's too hard. I'll just throw that animal away and get another one or I've lost interest in being a dog owner and that's the sad part about you know the other side of dogs as we know. So did anyone else have any other questions? It doesn't have to be barking related, I'm happy to... Yes Bronwyn, how are you tonight? That's good. I'm just wondering whether you could address how you then manage barking. Okay. Um, I have two rescue dogs. They are very territorial. Great dogs, but in the moment the postman comes or someone yes. comes to the door, they are at the barking and they won't stop if I yell at them. Yes. <laughs> we shake a tin and yes. they actually do come, but that does not suppress the barking. No. I'm just wondering whether you could So are they still barking, Bronwyn, when you... So if I walked into your front door, obviously they would bark, and if you use a shaker cam, which is something many people may have seen. The idea of those things, of course, are to break the dogs, literally to break the train of thought at that point. When a dog's furiously barking, we can stand there and yell and scream as much as we like generally, and you, you might as well be barking with them, as I say. Do they stop, and then as people enter, they'd still keep barking? Yeah. yeah. So for me, see, again, it's just my personal preference to that. Can I suppress that in some dogs? Absolutely. But for some owners, is it easier to look at a way of controlling the animal. We discussed with your little dog about that. So at my property even they're barking when you come to my front gate, which is what I want because I want them to let me, let, let me know that you're there. And in general, I would look at some way of either containing the animal or controlling its behaviour for a start. So if dogs are free ranging to front doors, even right back into puppy school we discussed this, you either need to control them initially on a lead or set up some sort of place command behaviour which could be in a crate or learning and teaching the dog under no stimulation initially that you must go to that area there. So I see people where they can send a dog to its bed under low distraction and then increase it under high distraction because once the dog's already moving and barking, you've already lost that control behaviour. 
Would I contain the dog to the back? Absolutely. And this is another reason why, if I've got dogs inside, I like to have them controlled generally 99.9% .9 of the time. Because if I've started a training program and then I go into the kitchen and at that point the dogs aren't under a stable command of stay on your bed or get in your crate or whatever I'm doing or they could be contained in a smaller area of the room, the minute I go there to put the kettle on, I could have a dog that after three weeks of training just runs straight up the hallway and starts barking again and I'm back where I started from. I will look at behaviour of dogs in general. So when people ask me about those sorts of things, Bronwyn, I would come to your house and sit down and I want to see what control you've got of your dog <laughs> under low stimulation or none. All right, which I know, you know, personally, your dogs are pretty well trained at times. You've got to look at which dog's performing the behaviour. So which dog's triggering the behaviour? Is there one actually that's a little bit more responsive to your commands than others when you've got more than one working together? Okay. Breaking the train of thought with a shaker can or anything like that is relevant, but I know, for example, that in some situations, you know, even with the postman, yes, they're going to be responsive to dogs. You can hear dogs, you know, three blocks away starting to bark and they're all starting to come along there. Your dogs don't access the front, though, do they? They don't access where the postman comes. Okay. So there you are. There's a containment thing in itself. If I had mine out the front where the postman actually puts the mail in, I would have a problem with them running the fence line as he comes along. So I don't allow that. I just don't allow them to be in that area. All right, again, because I could train them for months. I could spend years training them to stop doing that. And the day I'm not home when the postman comes can likely be the day that all that behavior has just gone straight out the window as they run up the fence and bark up and down at the fence at the owner. I mean at the postman or anyone approaching, anyone walking. So you can have dogs over time that learn if someone comes to the door, bark once on your bed. Okay, but what do we know? That behaviour should be practised way before we have the distraction of someone there and that should be slowly over time repeated as the distraction gets more and more prevalent to the dog and the dog experiences more stimulus. We should be able to then send the dog more and more to that position. So a lot of you will see nowadays they talk a lot about a place command um, in a lot of dog training things. If you look it up, you'll see place as a word that's referred to regularly. Um, so it, the idea literally is to direct a dog to go to a place, which could be a dog's bed or anything similar to that. I kind of, I mean, I think it's a great idea, but it really is a shortened version of get on your bed and stay there. Do as you're told over there, okay? So when people ask me to start doing things like that, it would always be a behaviour that we would start. So with young dogs, we would start that on lead. We can direct a dog to go to there. But the best trained dogs in the world are not generally accessing a lot of exit entry points of properties where they live and things like that, unless they're security dogs, where they're designed to be stopping people entering and they're barking furiously. So some of the best dogs that we see are very, very well contained in the environments they live in. Okay, and they're working dogs and everything too. So we don't see dogs that work in the police force and stuff running around in the backyards of police officers bailing people up as they're, it, it, an animal will defend and will also get out of control and remember, the attention we give sometime is a rewarding. So how we correct it, we need to come and look at the environment. We need to say, can we reduce the dog's access to certain areas? Can we look at individual training apart from the barking? That would increase the owner's control of the animal for a start. And then we increase the distraction. It's not an easy fix. I could do it with my dogs, but I know that when I'm not home, if I had them out the front, they'd be out there barking. I could correct them many ways I could do that but at the end of the day I, I would for me think well I, if you come well you know Brom because you've been to my house if you come to my house my dogs will bark furiously and they're sectioned to the back I'll know you're there um, and so I don't need to have them at the front telling me anything like that and that's my home if they're in my home I don't they can signal barks from somewhere to let me know that you've come to the front door when you knock apart from that I don't need them charging to the front door greeting my guests because they haven't come to see my dog, I would assume, generally. Um, some people probably have their friends come to see your dog. But then as we know, that escalates into all the other problems that we don't want, which is jumping all over your visitors, licking people, puppies play biting, pulling on people's clothes, people tripping over dogs. Everyone trying to say things like, don't look at the dog, just stand still and ignore it, it'll stop in a minute. Okay, all those little things that could be controlled if we just started to say to ourselves, this is my house, 
I love you as my pet, but you don't need to be doing any of this stuff. I will decide who comes in and out. So to teach you the right way, I need to start to take some control of you in our everyday life so that you know that under this routine, this is what you do. So if you come to my house, generally I would go out as they're barking and come out and actually, although my dogs are contained, I'll send them to their crates just from a distance in your crates which would calm them. If they're extremely overstimulated for whatever reason, I would go and close the door and they'll sit quietly there. Then after time as they've calmed, I would then let them out. If you wanted to talk to my dogs, you could. Because I don't want you to talk to my dogs when they're in high excitement anyway, because then you, they start wanting to jump on you and people go, oh, isn't she beautiful? And then she's jumping all over them and I don't want to doing any of that. So I'll do the best thing for her. And she is very beautiful, isn't she, Ellie? Yes, she is. And yeah, we know you're talking about you. All right, but I, I want her to be calm. So I don't want her to learn that behaviour. I want to remove a lot of that so that I don't even have to correct it because it's just not there. Because I, I just don't allow it to happen. So I would come to your house. That would be the first thing. Let's look at the environment. Let's say I would section them from here and there. All right. Postman would be the biggest thing that causes dogs bark. If you actually research that, I reckon it would be one of the biggest things that causes barking every day, in every neighbourhood, everywhere. So it's a chase based behaviour. I've worked in animal management many years ago. So we, look, and there's varying opinions on this sort of stuff, but we had a couple of postmen that were great. One, few dogs over the time that were very aggressive as well. So p people would leave treats in the thing. A couple of postmen we worked with over the years would throw treats, dogs stopped barking. A couple of people actually, one particular postman, I remember years ago, a blue catalogue out the beaches and they used to throw, the people would leave a tennis ball just in there and he would throw, and he would happily stop, throw the ball and he enjoyed it in the end, as he said. And the dog never even barked in the end, it would run up and sit and then he would throw the ball. And, he, and it, he would ride off and it would be chasing the ball and all was good. But you can't expect them to stop at every letterbox office and do that. Start, they'd be, you know, Australia Post would not be happy if we said to them, can you all start stopping and feeding dogs and rewarding them? But the biggest way for any of us, I think, because we're not home 24-7. 40 or 50 years ago, I think most, a lot of time women were home too. I think that makes a big difference. I think generally in lifestyle, people, there was always someone home, kids were home, dogs were roaming around. Dogs did a lot of natural stuff years ago. But we can't open the gates now and let them all wander around like they used to. So I think there was less barking then too, because I was just busy through the day. I'm not sure what they did sometimes. They probably went and met up with their mates down the end and they were all home generally when we came home, most of us. I grew up like that. Never even had fences where I grew up. Just dog was always there. Or followed us to school on the bike and then it went home or was in the street with the kids. And, but life has changed. So we've got to try and think, what is that dog doing? Why is it performing that behaviour? Does it want to bark at your guests or is it just defending territory? All right, and then when I see dogs in someone's home and they say to me, oh, no, I've got really good control of my dogs and, the, and I see a few scenarios, I think, no, well, actually, I haven't. It's just kind of a fluke that they're behaving the way they are sometimes. Generally, people say their dog's in love with them and it'll do anything, and then when we ask it to do a few small things, it doesn't actually perform any of that behaviour. might be good at licking your face or getting your attention when it wants to be patted, but is that dog necessarily well-behaved and, you know, and really compliant to things you want it to do, not normally? Okay, don't get me wrong, I kiss and cuddle my dogs, all right? I do that quite regularly. But we do lots of work together, so they get rewarded for that, which they really enjoy. Um, as a I've got a few questions coming through on Facebook now. Roz Walter would like to know, how do you train your dog to be calm in a crate? Okay, great question, because that just doesn't happen done, all right? I, over a period of time, introduce a crate to any dog, whether it be a puppy or an older dog. Initially, if the dog's been for exercise, is a great way to think about it initially. So we've done some work, the dog's already a bit tired. Now, if we've got a dog that is used to being inside with people and we want to start crating an animal, I would normally recommend the crating inside first. Okay, and it would only be close proximity to the owner. So we could start a scenario of, you're sitting watching TV tonight, let's put the crate just there, just beside you and let's start having the dog go in and out. I'll use treats as a way to encourage an animal in and out of a crate, but I'm not a sole believer, because I see some dogs that take two or three treats and then, eh, don't think so, not gonna walk in there. That's, I've done that three times, what's the point? So I'll generally often with a calmer dog, very carefully place them into a crate, and I will within a few days, maximum, I would start closing the door, but again when I'm close. So then I would do it for short periods of time slowly increase the time, then I'd increase the distance. So this could go over a week. Then I'd start to change the, the dynamics of things a bit by I might be sitting here with the dog in a crate, now I'm just gonna walk in the kitchen and put the kettle on or get a glass of water. 
and I'll watch for the response from the animal. If I see too much anxiety and stress, I'd maybe say, okay, we've pushed it a bit far with some. Some dogs I'll correct in a crate, so I could hit the crate and correct with a, with a quiet command. A lot of those things, though, I like to talk to people about where and when we correct, so it's not straight away about telling people to yell at your dog in the crate and tell it to be quiet. We need to look at the individual dog's behaviour, because if we have dogs with high stress anxiety, we may not correct them straight up for that. And it's not about dragging the dog out and belting it, it's correcting a, a behaviour of when you're in there, you need to be quiet. But if you introduce it, I also feed my dogs in the crates every night. So it's a game. And I don't even see it because it happens while I'm inside, but I've now, I now know what the relevant trigger is because I get the dry food bucket out of the pantry and I used to wonder, is it the pantry door? Is it the lid that the, or the, actual, the wire of the actual handle or the lid? But after asking my mother recently, it is the handle, she believes, because she was sitting outside and I said, can you tell me? Because I open the pantry door hundreds of times a day and I never have a set routine of feeding. So it's not exactly the same time. So there's no body clock generally working for my dogs. It could be any time at night, depending on what's going on. And I hear the literal bang, bang, bang of three dogs. And as I come out, they're all sitting in the crates with little heads like that. <laughs> Bowls are on the top and I just dish out the food, pop it in. Why did I start that? Why did I start crating, if any of you wonder in my life? Because I became a mother. And after all the years of loving dogs, I had that beautiful border collie who was great with children as far as I knew. She'd, but I had a six week old beautiful baby boy in my arms and I looked at that dog one day and I thought, you know what? How do I control that dog or keeps Jared safe and the dog as he gets older and could crawl out the door? And part of me, although I'd recommended it for many people, it didn't suit, didn't, well, it didn't have to be implemented in our lifestyle as a, a couple for my, me and my husband, but as we became parents, it did. And as we had three dogs, I don't have any issues with what they eat. I don't have worries with dogs fighting over food. I don't have problems with her trying to steal food from the little bloke or vice versa. Everyone eats calmly, bowls are removed done no issues no issues with people visiting so I can use crates for that if people come over and we're going to sit around the table outside I don't ask my guests to come over and be stared at all night by my dog while we're having a barbecue and I don't put my dogs in that situation because that's stressful for some dogs so I see people I go to people's houses with dogs laying under tables it makes me really uncomfortable as a visitor okay because I see that I see things in dogs that people don't see so for me I never even go there and relax half the time so I'm too busy looking at the dog thinking that dog's behavior is making me really anxious it's not comfortable with us all being around the table while it's laying under there so I advocate for them as their owner to give them a place to feel calm and quiet so it's a gradual process slowly and quietly at times over the and then over the duration we increase the actual stimulation of when we ask the dog to go in. So if you come to visit and you're excited to see my guests, actually that's not your choice because you're my dog, so you're gonna go in there. But because you know that, you will just go and lay quietly in there. So I can, you know, that's, yeah, generally a process. Any help with things like that, people can give me a ring anytime. I can guide them a lot with that, yeah. Do we have any more questions from in the room? I've just got one. Yeah. We walk our dog <coughs> the other day, and most dogs she walks calmly past, but this, a couple of dogs she, goes off a tree. Yeah. And they in, are they in your neighbourhood in, in properties? No, dogs that she doesn't really know. Yeah, it's like walking but towards you. Be, it might be the same dog every yes. time. Yes, and it's walking towards you, for example, yeah. as you come down the footpath yeah. and things like that. So that's a very common problem, as we know, relevant to many things. Firstly, control of dogs on leads. So when I have and for dogs, when we've got dogs coming towards each other, a bit out in front, usually all excited, jumping around everywhere, people walking like this with the dog pulling them, oh, go over that way and that way like that, and oh, it wants to say hello to your dog, and I'll just let it pull in the face like that. Is that, is that not no, 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 no. So that brings up a whole different topic straight up, socialising of dogs, which is a huge thing that I cover extensively. And we're learning more about it. In nature, not only canines, any other species that we can think of. If I come up to you and go, g'day, how are you going? How are you going to feel generally about that? All right, yet people have all come under the impression that, okay, they all need to go up into each other's faces like that. Now, with young dogs, sometimes that's okay and they all have a little play and how you're going. But as time goes on for many dogs, one little experience like that that may be nothing to us can escalate into a huge behavioural problem or a socialising problem for a dog. So they can read body language of other dogs coming towards them. That could be a relevant thing. My dogs are beautiful to walk on lead. My team's dogs are magnificent to walk on lead. But dogs that come at our dogs off lead 
or frantically moving across in front and pulling owners that way as they come straight into the face of them can trigger some anxious behaviour in my dogs. They're walking nicely here and calm. They don't need to have dogs coming in their face. If they do, they would often react. So I often say to people, firstly, look at the position of your dog. Is it walking where it should be? Okay, controlled, nice and calm, going about its business. What is the behaviour of the dog coming towards you? Is it a dog that's come into the face once and actually maybe caused a, a problem for the dog that you didn't even see? But that first dog that does that, that might be a little bit too over the top, might be enough for the next one that comes along. And it may be three other dogs that walk reasonably calmly past, but another one coming displaying the same behaviour could again trigger the same response from the dog. And over time that can escalate, which is why we see huge on-leash anxious aggression behavioural issues going on and the combination of things are going on there as well. We can remove some of it, but if your dog's had a really bad experience, it takes a very committed handler to completely. We can fix it, because I've proven it recently with some clients over, we've spent a long time working with some dogs and we take on amazing knowledge and continue to increase our knowledge and take on skills from you know, colleagues of mine all over the world that help to help people fix some of these dogs. But that's also why I say I'm very careful about dog exercise areas and socialising off lead. So, so taking them to the park and, and letting her off lead to play with the other dogs is not a good thing? Not necessarily, depends on the dog. So if you got together with the same people every yeah, day, the yep. what you need to remember then though is, you also need to teach your dog manners when it's on a lead though, so that when it sees other dogs in a different environment, it doesn't mean that it's an all out mosh pit for everyone to jump all over each other and be antisocial that way. So when we do our training classes, dogs learn what I call canine etiquette. And, and some of the photos you saw earlier where there was just dogs in drop stay positions or that line of dogs walking, it would be hard to believe that in that line of dogs were three of the most reactive dogs I've ever worked with. And over time, but if at, at this point now, if I allowed an over, overexcited young dog to go up into the face of some of those dogs, would they react? Absolutely. But they will walk calmly in the community now and you can't pick. So I don't mind them socialising like that, but I think they also need to learn respect when they're out in a public place as far as walking down footpaths and things like that. Yeah, yeah, but the odd one, and it could be, as I said, many people, we're not reading behaviour coming towards them. So sometimes we might see a trigger in some, you know, five metres up the footpath. We can see by the behaviour of that dog coming, are they looking at each other? Is there eye contact going on? Is there certain postures that are happening that we don't see? If I meet you on the street any time with my dogs, and I talk to a few ladies, it's generally us girls walking in the morning, so I don't know why that is. It's just generally us up and about walking our dogs. But I talk to quite a few lovely ladies out in my area, but we all have that thing and we all know the dogs, You know, we would be at this distance generally. Dogs are all in a sit. Their dogs are in a sit. We're having a talk, lovely way you go. One little dog that my little dog plays with, um, he, he has a little play with her when he regularly sees her. Apart from that, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm very, very vigilant on that. So I have people regularly coming towards me saying, oh, my dog's very friendly. I said, look, I really appreciate that. But I don't want your dog coming into the face of my dogs like that to make it feel uncomfortable. It might feel uncomfortable. I don't know sometimes how it's going to react because it can happen in a split second from we see many dogs come in front on like that and we see that initial, oh, yeah, not too bad. And then within seconds, without us even realising, it's escalating to aggression and then we're in all sorts of trouble. So the next time we confront a dog front on, we might just repeat that behaviour a bit quicker because the last time I didn't, that dog had a go at me. And then over time that, that can progress. You can train dogs. So what are the, what are the advantages of training and socialising in a class? It's not about, for my client base, I'm a pet dog trainer. So I'm, I totally admire competition training because the work that goes into that is astronomical. Okay, but it's not my client base of what I do. I have, I call myself an Aussie, good old Aussie dog owner who has nice dogs that walk nicely, don't impact on my life, and that's my client base. So even in some of the classes I do, we can change the dynamics of the relationship with people's dogs fairly quickly just to give people some skills, handler skills, how to handle a dog, what to do if a dog does that, so that the dog understands that that's not correct, this is what I want. If we don't show them that, then they generally don't know. They will go about, because remember, we're their number one educator if we take them on. They can't all get together and communicate, you know, the adult dogs aren't there to tell young dogs that's not acceptable, don't do this, don't do that, because we know when we see them naturally, a you know, a mother and her litter and the pack, if we saw that, all that other stuff that we see in the domestic world would be corrected and finished with very early. We'd never see that happen. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, uh, aggression, like, uh, you know, how you, sometimes you've got a dog and as happy as Larry, but then other times it will 
be aggressive and like go to nip you or whatever. Yes. Um, I haven't had that problem, but uh, or but with my um, headstrong schnauzer three dogs ago. Yes. Um, he was very very headstrong. Uh, he was the boss and he was trying to put it over me and. Um, I've seen people hit their dogs and things like that um, and you know, someone once told me that uh, or I think it was my breeder said you've got to think like the mother and like yeah, the mother would uh, to discipline the dog would grab it behind the neck and stand over the top of it and mm. uh, growl mm. and um, yeah my breeder actually said yeah just grab hold of the scruff of the neck put it on its side kneel over it and you, you can tell the thing's shaking and then you, you wait until uh, it's all calm and once you get over the top of it, uh, off of the top of it, um, it's nice and quiet and it realises, oh, there's a leader of the pack there, yeah. so yeah. to speak. And look, that, that is certainly 25 years ago when I started this, that was very much prevalent in training as far as how we would be in control. And everyone knows we hear the leader of the pack and all that. And I think there's a relevance to some of that stuff. I, I don't have a specific structure with mine as far as, you know, many times we'll see people and I have to say to people, look, you need to look at which is the top dog, pat the dog. I don't do so much of that in particular because I just control their life pretty well in other ways. So they are calm and happy to accept because there's no confusion for them either. So they just know. I don't, the reason I don't do a lot of grabbing dogs on the scruff of the neck and things like that in training now is because we all, it's always been a thing that's been done. And is it wrong? It's hard to say whether it's wrong because many dogs it's been done to and it's had an amazing result. And, it, and there's many other techniques that people do that I wouldn't do. Um, and there's some things I do that probably people would say I wouldn't do it that way. I don't say that anything's in those sorts of things. I mean, if people are physically abusing an animal and hurting them, I would definitely not agree with anything like that. There's nothing involved in that. It's a bit of body language and a bit of... I think we can do it sometimes, though, without doing some of that more physical stuff now, just because we're learning other ways of going about it. So if we're changing the lifestyle a bit, if we're making a dog work a bit more, just, for t just making your dog work for attention and removing a bit of just attention given for nothing can have a huge impact on the relationship you have with them. If we pull back everything and then start to give it just a little bit here and there, it means a lot more, all right? And that's a big thing, okay? I, look, 20 years ago, that was how we were teaching people to do some things. Yeah, because my wife, um, with this dog, she never had dogs before. Yes. And, um, uh, there's Apollo, I'll call him, which yes. is what his name was. Um, he was a magnificent dog. Yes. But, um, headstrong, like when it comes to clipping around his feet. Yes. Um, he hated that. Yes. And he would get a little bit, bit anno snappy. annoyed. And um, but Rose got upset when I put him on his side <coughs> and, mm. and that. And <clears throat> but after that, he respected um, Rose as well. Yes. And so it, it. It had a positive effect, really. Yeah didn't really hurt, I mean, you know, putting through that small moment of, oh, okay, obviously I've crossed the boundaries here. Yes, yeah, and I would love to know if dogs could talk to us, do they actually see that as that? Like, how do they actually, I don't actually know, I mean, it, it imitates a behaviour. We find it fascinating, puppy school, because we can walk our older dogs around some of those pups when they're in our classes, and everything's controlled on lead, and, and they just show these amazing behaviours that are so natural because they don't jump on the older dogs, do they? They walk around them, they, and, or they'll go to jump on the older dog and the older dog will just give a low little growl and then the pup just sits back and you can see it registering all of that. Yet we as humans bumble around for years trying to achieve the same thing. So it's never a, I don't condone, I, there's so many training things out there that people tell me they do with their dogs and, and, and there's no obvious cruelty or anything like that and I, will, I am still very much open to anything. I don't, you know, I don't believe that everything should be food based. I use food as a reward on and off for things. I try to make it gold. So when we're doing really fun, cool stuff, liver treats pretty well the epitome for my dogs and that's a really, you know, a high motivator and then a lot of the time just to get affection and attention is a great motivator for dogs. Yeah, observation of your dog too. Learn, you just, yes. You, you learn their behaviour and you, yeah. You Every dog's just, different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, teacher, we're just running out of time and I've got a few questions.
questions through Facebook yeah. if I can pop yep. those to you, Linda. Um, Emma Penhallian, and I apologise, Emma, if I've pronounced you wrong incorrectly, name incorrectly, she has issues with dogs um, barking when people go uh, past her, her property. Yes. What can you recommend for her to try? So generally, initially, um, and thanks for your question, Emma, too, by the way. Um, initially, that's where I would start to say to people some form of containment where you can if she's home. I mean, this is the thing. We've got to look at high traffic times. Can we contain the dog? Can we crate train the dog? Can we have an area where we could put it? And then if we can't control it when we're not home, again, people need to address the dog's access to certain areas. That's my total belief in that sort of thing because, as I said, I've done it personally. I don't believe it's possible to just sit on a veranda and train a dog, don't bark at those people moving past. Okay. I think you can do it if you're going to sit there every day of the dog's life, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But I think initially... You look at, can I restrict the dog's access to that area? So people will do things like block visual view. Okay, that's one way they do it. Um, people put up obstacles to try and stop dogs running up fence lines. Now, I always look at things like that when I go to houses. If I see a big channel up a fence line, I know the dog's been pretty busy there at some stage. <laughs> right? That hasn't happened in five minutes. All right, but I certainly, and even with any of my clients that we talk about, and this would be the first thing I'd say, well, initially we've got to contain the animal. How do we stop that dog getting to that area to do that? And we know that it can't be locked in a crate all day, every day. But we know also that, and especially this time of year, let's face it, there's not many people out walking after about 8.30 in the morning nowadays and certainly not till the cool of the evening. Um, if they are, we need to address with them why they walk in their dog anyway, generally. Or, you know, I mean, you can have people just walking or bikes going past. But it would be high stimulus times restrict the animal um, and confine it at, at some stage. And certainly then at other times, if you find you can't control it, then you really need to look at your environment. And sometimes that's not a huge expense. People get all think, I think, feel quite uncomfortable that it's going to spend thousands of dollars on fences. Sometimes it doesn't take that much. If you just sit down and have a bit of a look at what you've got, does it mean that the dog has to have, you know, three acres of backyard? No, as I keep saying, it doesn't have to have a huge area generally. Do you know what your dogs do most of the time when you're not home? Yeah. They're not running around playing with toys and saying, oh, well, the bones are away. Except, so when we see destruction, what do we know? That happens generally fairly soon after you've left most of that stuff. It's usually anxiety based, all right, or boredom, depending on if the dog hasn't been exercised. Certainly confinement in that. And again, if Emma would like to contact me to help with the crating process or what I'd suggest to go about it. I like to talk to people. Sometimes they can tell me about their property even on the phone. I could say, well, look, have you thought about this or, or that? Many people with, that, as I said, it's a high set Queensland is the amount of people. And I say, you know what? You could actually contain an animal quite safely and securely in a section of your underneath of your house because you've already got that there often and you could just reduce that size of something and make it into a, a kennel type environment that you could utilise on and off. People feel bad about that, but to me, that's better than a dog stressed running up and down the fence, barking and driving around mad and stressing itself to the max. Mm. Um, a common question we're getting, Linda, is um, dogs barking at night. Mm. People aren't quite sure why their dog suddenly decides to yeah. um, make Sometimes a noise. Sometimes it could be a good reason for that, do you think? But then what do we do? <laughs> Once we investigate it, what happens from there? All right. If we leave the dog out and there isn't anything obvious, then obviously it could keep barking. It can be an attention-seeking behaviour, then we know, because, well, every time I do this, you come out. Is there something else moving in our environment that we can't see? So they're very receptive to that sort of thing. I'm, again, a big believer in, con in confinement or containment of an animal. So some, most of my staff actually have their dogs sleep inside at night in crates, okay? Their dogs are outside a lot through the day uh, and that's, their, that's how they go about that for some of those reasons because the dog's not barking all the time then at night and, and annoying the, everyone and keeping everyone awake and it sets a great pattern. So these dogs actually stand at the door literally and wait for the door to open, walk straight in their crates, go to bed, have a set pattern. Would, has anyone ever considered that dogs that are up all night barking and running around actually have an irregular sleep pattern and that is a behavioural issue? We don't even think about that. So dogs that I work with regularly also need to learn to sleep. Sit down and relax and see that. That's one of the biggest tools I can teach a dog right there. Just like us. They can't go to yoga classes like us. So we ask them. Yes? Just what you're talking about, I used to have two white dogs. They have a veranda. I would have the gate open at night. As soon as she heard any noise, she would be off the veranda chasing it barking. Um, but from uh, Linda's mentor, <laughs> her advice was container, shut my veranda. You then give her a safe place to be in. She knows she's not on guard. She doesn't have to worry about what's going on there. 
and we all got much better sleep. And that's exactly clear. And you know what? People say to me though, but I need the dog to, do, to be keeping an eye out. What if someone, I can guarantee you that even in the deepest sleep at my house, if were contained in the crate, then they would absolutely bark if someone wasn't be coming in, supposed to be coming in my yard. I, there's never an issue with that. I've never worried about dogs not barking if they need to. But what I do know, Ian, we're just commenting here, Ellie's feet are going, she's dreaming at the moment there. Okay. There's a lot of studies done now on how well a dog sleeps in a crate into its deepest sleep of relaxation, more so than in anywhere else they've, they've been doing a lot of research on it. Um, so again, that's proof in the pudding, that dog. And I, I'm not, I could walk out and leave that dog there and you would not, it would not make a sound. And I could go out and drive off and I would never do that to her obviously, but I could if I had to. So I know also that if anything changed ever in my life, that I couldn't have my dogs for a time. I needed to ask my staff, can you look after my dogs quickly? I've got to go somewhere. I could send all three of my dogs with their crates and that would make everyone's life an absolute breeze as well because it would never be an issue for them. I think I'll take one last question from Facebook, Linda. I'm just conscious yes. of the time. Yep. Heather wants to know, how does she desensitise her dog? She's overprotective and barks at noise on the other side of the fence or at the front door. Okay, so desensitising a dog to those things. Again, it initially would have to be a, a thing of control under low stimulation or low noise, similar to what you mentioned, Bronwyn. So dogs, you know, barking at doors when people come and things like that. Can you set up scenarios where you say to your friends or your family, okay, I'm going to start a training process. Initially, I'm going to get better control of the animal, whether it's inside or outside. And then I'm going to ask, and you can employ your friends and family to do this. You know, you can bribe them with a meal afterwards if they would come over and help you train your dog. But I would be setting up scenarios then to say, okay, so we're going to have the dog on a lead, for example, and there's the front door. And I'm initially going to just have the dog in a controlled situation and I'll ask people over time to come and knock on the door. And then I'd increase that to, okay, I'd like to perhaps have the dog over here. So we remember that you could use two different things though, because if you wanted to go down this road, you've already got the animal contained. Okay, so you've got it used to somewhere there to be quiet. If it got overstimulated with that first initial person coming to the door, we could learn a technique of how we, and there's many techniques to that, that I wouldn't say to anyone, go and do straight away. I'd like to guide you and see what the dog's doing, but I could correct behaviour of barking. So there, over time, I just remove that whole behaviour. And then eventually I can get to the point of someone pulls up, dog signals once that someone's there, in your crate or on your bed. All right? But it's nothing that can be done by yelling at the dog, chasing the dog around the house or around the backyard trying to grab hold of it, screaming out the window, you know, throwing something from 50 metres away. Remember with correcting behaviour, it has to happen like that, literally. So if a dog's barking and by the time I get out the front door, run around the side and tell it to stop, it often can't associate the correction with the behaviour. It's associating it to something else. So if we come home and the dog's been digging a hole and we go, crook, we've, there's no point. You can be angry about it, but there's no point correcting your dog for that because you didn't catch it doing it and it can't think six hours ago, I dug, I dug that hole, that's why you're going crook at me. So it would be, definitely you can desensitise, so you expose the animal over time to what triggers the behaviour but you have to implement initial control and some training of some sort to say that you can eventually start to correct it under mild stimulation, all right, and then increase it as, as it goes along. Sometimes it does. So sometimes I'll use a shaker tin because the whole principle of that is it's an empty tin with some stones in it and when you make a sound, you could shake it and then correct the behaviour. Um, I'll use them sometimes. Sometimes I'll just use a loud noise. So sometimes if I'm at people's houses and we see different things going on, I'm just trying to show owners some things you could do just in your everyday environment. Sometimes squirter bottles work for things. Sometimes they don't. Some dogs say, that's great. It's really hot. Beautiful. Keep squirting in my face. Beautiful. <laughs> that's great. Actually, could you turn it up onto the full thing so it just goes all over me? All right. And, they, and yet some dogs, as soon as we, that stops behaviour but other people say it doesn't do a thing. Um, I like to, I'll just make a loud noise. So I always carry a black folder when I go to your house. So it's quite funny, I'll often have it on the table and I'll, a dog will be displaying something. I'll say to the owner, I'll always pre-warn the owner, don't get a fright because I'm, and I can hit the table sometimes with something like that, enough to correct the behavior and then from there, correct it. So this dog used to bark. So my dogs actually have to be very, well, they're put under a fair bit of pressure at times. So they're at home in a crate and I have people bring a dog to my house sometimes for some work. And it could be a very over-anxious, over-excited, barking, out-of-control dog on a lead coming in my house and they're just here in their crates 
watching and they've had to learn that you're not allowed to bark or do anything, you just stay in there. It's basically, I've said you stay there, I'll deal with this, I don't need you to help with anything, you can stay there and be quiet. So I have corrected this dog initially in the crate for barking because she used to get overstimulated by that. So I could correct verbally and then a couple of times I've hit the top of the crate with things and corrected verbally. So she hasn't seen that initial correction coming and then I've corrected it and now almost foolproof. All right, doesn't, not an issue. As soon as we go in there, bring in any dog you like. I'm not gonna bark. Would they bark behind the fence if I had them loose? Absolutely, they'd be running up and down the fence barking at stimulus like that. You know, again, look, many people could probably correct that with many other training techniques. Would it be something that most of my client base would be able to manage? Probably not. So we're not all professional dog trainers. We've just got to implement things that make life easy. We're all busy. We have many different routines in our lives nowadays. I think, you know, that's again a huge thing. Let's implement things that make life easy for the dog as well. So that the less stress they go through and the less stressed we are, the happier everyone is. It's all going to be, you know, a, a much happier place to go through there. Excellent. I'm pretty sure there's probably some extra questions in the room, but unfortunately we've run out of time. I'd like to thank Linda for coming along and helping you, us Michelle. tonight with her 25 years of experience. I think we can all agree that she knows her stuff. Um, Linda's got some business cards at the back of the room. I'd also like to point out we have some lovely ladies with us from Green Cross Vets. If you've got any questions you want to ask them as you walk out the door, you're more than welcome to. There's also some giveaways down there. Grab a lead, grab a water bottle, and there's some written information there about how you can work with your dog to address nuisance parking. Um, this video that we're taking tonight will be available on Council's website in the next couple of days, so you can go back and watch it again there. Or when you get home, check out Facebook and it'll be available on Facebook as yeah. well. Thanks everyone for coming and um, keep an eye out for other workshops that we're going to be doing throughout the year. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thanks for coming everyone, I really appreciate it. I just want to acknowledge too, we've got one of our wonderful animal management officers. Is there one down there or is there two There's of them? Two, two of them there, there now, actually. okay? Terry and Annie. All right, so I want all of you to remember one very important thing because I've walked in their shoes, okay? So many people are judgmental of people who do that sort of work. When you walk in the shoes of those people, you would have an understanding of the job they do. They are there to help, okay? And if they weren't there, we would not have a safe community to live in, let alone own dogs in. So I always say to people, be very supportive of people in those roles because it's a, it's a big responsibility and we need to have them. Sometimes we mightn't agree with some of the things that are done in that sort of work, but it's got to be done. It's a job that no one else wants to do, and um, I have a huge respect for people that do that work. So well done, troops. I always, I hope I don't give you too much work, because I'm always telling people to ring up, and, you know, if you have a problem in your neighbourhood, let the council know, because they can't be everywhere. So we've all got to take that responsibility to do that and try and keep the community safe. Don't feel bad if a dog's wandering on the street and it's causing problems for everyone and harassing people and whatever. Don't feel bad to actually ring up and make a complaint about that. Because at the end of the day, you're probably saving someone and you're actually doing the dog a favour generally. Because if that can be stopped quickly, that animal's perhaps not gonna perform something like a bite or, a, or an injury or give, you know, injure a dog or a human or, or anything like that. And therefore the dog suffers in the end as well. Anyway, a lot of people feel, oh, it's not the dog's fault. Well, the dog can't keep itself in its yard or do things like that. So we need to take responsibility for that sort of thing. So well done guys, I appreciate what you do all the time. I know exactly what it's like. So thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate your time. Give me a call, please, anytime. Just grab a card and give us a call. If I don't answer, leave a message, I would always ring you back. Um, and I'd love to talk to you about your dogs at any point. So thanks very much.